Before we get started, this video is sponsored by Opera GX, a browser specifically for gamers like us. Opera GX sports a ton of really cool features to optimize your browsing experience. For example, you can use GX Control to maximize your PC's performance, allowing you to do away with lag whilst keeping your browser open. The panel allows you to limit the CPU and RAM usage that you're willing to allow the browser to utilize, meaning that you no longer have to close tabs to increase performance whilst gaming. You can also use the network limiter to restrict the bandwidth Opera GX utilizes, allowing you to maximize the bandwidth used for online gaming and streams whilst your browser is open. You can also customize your Opera GX browser. You can change the themes, wallpapers and colors, even adding in your own custom wallpaper, which can all be done via the easy setup. Furthermore, you can also stay up to date with all the latest gaming news and games, including free games that Opera GX often searches for. In the GX corner, you can find the best deals, newest releases and breaking game news all in one easily accessible space. You can switch between the stores of particular platforms and even see upcoming game releases in an inbuilt calendar. You can even get Opera GX on mobile, and that's pretty snazzy. GX Mobile can even be connected to your desktop version, and there is so much more. So if you're a gamer, which is more than likely if you're watching this video, let's be honest, Opera GX is tailored for you. So what are you waiting for? Follow the link in the description and download Opera GX today. It's been a while since I've even spoken about Assassin's Creed properly on this channel, and the reason behind that is partially due to the issues with Ubisoft that have surfaced over the past year plus, however it's also due to my frustrations with the current state of one of the franchises I used to hold so dear, and Ubisoft's modern design philosophy in general. However, none of that matters in the context of today's video because, let's be honest, my disillusionment with Ubisoft and Assassin's Creed now should not take away from the past and previous Assassin's Creed games sway on my gaming history, and by extension the history of my channel and allowing that to ever get in the way was my mistake. No matter how messed up Ubisoft may seem to be these days, there's more going on. The passion behind these games still came from human beings. The things that I love about the Assassin's Creed games of Days Gone are no less valid because of the shitty situation at the company that published them. And to deny myself and the viewer base we've built here around these games over this, of the right to love these games is simply nonsensical, and we all knew that, and so taking a hardline stance against all things Ubisoft past, present and future was only depriving myself of games I used to love, and only depriving viewers of what they came to this channel for, to a point. I still firmly believe that I have to evolve the channel, move it forward, and I will still more than likely give future Ubisoft products a wide berth considering they just simply don't appeal to me for one, and newer Assassin's Creed titles have definitely lost the magic that made me love them in the past, and I just simply don't agree with how Ubisoft runs their company. Monetizing everything through microtransactions to the point where it's utterly ridiculous and hilarious, and don't even get me started on the allegations of misconduct that surfaced well over a year ago now but that doesn't mean that I need to alienate the past. And so the best way forward for me was to, when I was ready, revisit the Ezio trilogy for the 10 year anniversary since the launch of Assassin's Creed Revelations, celebrating 10 years since the Ezio trilogy was properly completed. And now that date has come to pass, and I feel like there's no better time to revisit this gem of a trilogy and fill ourselves with nostalgia. I sat down and blasted through Assassin's Creed 2 Brotherhood and Revelations over the course of just under a week, not because I was rushing, but because I found myself being hooked again. Re-experiencing these games has been a lot of fun and I couldn't pull myself away from it. The experience reminded me of my love for these games and I wanted to articulate said love in a video way better and with more clarity than I've ever been able to provide in the past. I think the short hiatus from Assassin's Creed in general has allowed me to return to these games and for the first time in a long time properly suck in the feeling of playing them. This is up there as one of my favourite trilogies in gaming, with a huge focus on one of my favourite characters in gaming, and so I hope I'm able to do it justice, but I suppose you'll be the judge of that. It's probably worth mentioning that everything that could have gone wrong with this project so far has, and hopefully the content is worth it in the end, because the amount of hours it's taken me to get this recording part alone done has been mental. Anyway, that's my problem, and if you're watching this video, said problem has either been resolved, or I've found a workaround I'm happy with. Knowing my laziness, it's probably the latter, and so it's completely by the by. However, these games have always been worth the effort to me. I still vividly remember my first times playing them, and I couldn't put a number to the amount of times I've played through these games since. 
I remember my dad introducing me to Assassin's Creed all those years ago, before Assassin's Creed 2 even, and it was he who first showed me the promotional content for Assassin's Creed 2, so I suppose you have him to blame or thank for this depending on whether or not you want me dead. But I still quite strongly remember the feeling of excitement and anticipation in the build up to playing Assassin's Creed 2 all those years ago. And for the first time in a long time when I committed myself to doing a playthrough of the trilogy to do this video, I felt that excitement again. Because during my short hiatus I had this feeling, this sickly feeling, that I'd never be able to bring myself to sit down and play these games that I love so much ever again. And that would have been a massive shame, because this video is going to be packed with things that I have to say, and I would have regretted never having the opportunity to say them. So join me on a truly thrilling experience in which we revisit these games to find out what makes them so special. What makes them so compelling, what makes them so interesting and full of mystery, how they set themselves apart from each other and other games, amongst many other points that I feel are well worth making. So please, take a seat, get comfortable, Grab yourself a brew and prepare to watch Assassin's Creed the Ezio Trilogy 10 years later. of society are fragile, and that we must be the shepherds of our own civilization. To say that everything is permitted is to understand that we are the architects of our actions, and that we must live with their consequences, whether glorious or tragic. There is no book or teacher to give you the answers, to show you the path. Choose your own way. Do not follow me, or anyone else. Our adventure obviously begins with Assassin's Creed 2, the first part of the Ezio trilogy. The game begins with a recap of Assassin's Creed 1, which is the perfect place for us to start, because a lot of the main themes of Assassin's Creed 1 carry over into Assassin's Creed 2, most notably that sense of mystery. The first Assassin's Creed establishes this, but the sense of mystery I'm on about comes into its own over the course of the Ezio trilogy. The game begins with us staring at the same wall we were staring at at the end of Assassin's Creed 1, puzzled by what these mysterious symbols painted in blood could possibly mean. Before we can rack our brains too hard, Lucy Stillman shows up, seemingly to rescue Desmond from Abstergo. Before we can do that though, she instructs Desmond to get into the Animus. What we witness is a woman giving birth. The product is a baby boy. Interestingly, we appear to be playing as this baby boy, being instructed to press buttons to move the child. And this is where we witness Ezio Auditore take his first breath. This is the very beginning of Ezio's journey, a character that we see from his birth here to his death in Assassin's Creed Embers, which is a short story that takes place roughly a decade after the events of Assassin's Creed Revelations. The game does well to not provide too much context too early, that's all we get for now as we're thrust out of the Animus and now we've got to escape Abstergo. We're taken from there to an Assassin hideout in Italy, which is conveniently where Abstergo Industries building where Desmond was being kept was now placed. I don't think this was the initial plan in Assassin's Creed 1 mind, but 
is there now, where Lucy asks Desmond to properly become an assassin, explaining that there's more to this than just Abstergo, but for now that's all we're getting. This is where we're introduced to two other modern day assassins, Rebecca Crane and Sean Hastings, Sean being a brilliant historian and Rebecca being an animus technician. This is where we're introduced to a classic storytelling trope of, for every piece of advanced technology owned and built by a multi-billion dollar company, there is a version of it that can be built on a budget in a basement. This is where we re-enter the animus, this time to Florence in 1476, where we rejoin Ezio, now 17 years old. We're introduced to Ezio's character as a brash Florentine noble, completely unaware of his assassin heritage, and he's first shown engaging in a street brawl with his rival, Vieri de Pazzi. It seems like horseplay at first, but his rival's into some shady shit which we will learn about later, but what's important for now is that we are experiencing what is basically a day in the life of Ezio at this point. We start at this brawl, twatting the shit out of everybody with nothing better to do, and we get to experience the brotherly bond between Ezio and Federico, heading to the doctor to get Ezio patched up after his brawl, and then racing Federico to the top of a tower is good sport. You get the vibe that at this point that Ezio is living a good life, which is what makes this introduction so hard hitting when you know the journey that follows after. It is a good life we lead, brother. Uh, the best. May it never change. And may it never change us. Then we pay a rather interactive visit to Ezio's love interest. It's a little awkward, but I suppose it helps paint the picture, and that's fair enough. Upon returning home, Ezio gets chewed out by his father, Giovanni, who encouragingly says, though Ezio's actions are unacceptable, they remind him of himself when he was Ezio's age. And then we proceed to find ourselves running errands for the man and other members of the family. Like I mentioned, further providing a good insight into the quality of life that Ezio has at this point in time. It's a good life, one free from most burdens of responsibility. Ezio at this point in the story is little more than a mere young adult, and that's how the game makes us see him. Granted, a young adult who seems to know the Jedi mind trick. I loved him. No, Claudia. You only thought you did. He should suffer for what he's done. Fuck me, that was a 180. Our first half an hour with Ezio, in which he's little more than a young Florentine noble, serves a solid purpose, and that purpose is to humanise him. With Assassin's Creed 1, we didn't do this with Altair because he was more of a subject. It was not necessarily a character-driven story. However, Assassin's Creed 2 is. Altair had some character development, don't get me wrong, but Assassin's Creed 2 is far more complex than that. And the best way to show that this is distinct from the previous game was to show Ezio's life before he became an assassin and how his life was changed to make him one. This pre-assassin or pre-assassin stuff segment is nice and concise and to the point, so it doesn't eat too much of your time without getting to the bulk of the game, but it also establishes some characters, it establishes the story, it establishes Ezio, and it also gives you a feeling that something bad is about to happen. And then the bad thing does happen, and Ezio's lifestyle is thrust completely upside down, inside the space of only a few minutes of playing the game. Ezio's father and brothers are arrested and the guards are looking for him too. He rushes to visit his father who tells him to go back to the house and use his gift, Eagle Vision, to find the secret room. Inside which he finds robes and weapons including a letter he must deliver to Uberto Alberti to present at Giovanni's trial. Unbeknownst to all, this old family friend Alberti is in on the conspiracy and Ezio's father and brothers are hanged leading Ezio down a path of revenge, first against Uberto Alberti himself, being trained to survive by Paola, and armed with his father's hidden blade which was repaired by Leonardo da Vinci, a character and historical figure that we all know of, portrayed over the course of Two and Brotherhood as Ezio's closest and oldest friend. After violently and mercilessly killing Uberto for his betrayal, Ezio takes his mother and sister and flees Florence, heading to his uncle Mario at Monteregioni, where he learns about the assassins and his father's role as one, and is trained further by Mario Auditore after one very on-the-nose easter egg introduction. Don't you recognize me? It's-a me, Mario! At first, Ezio struggles to understand his assassin bloodline and its importance, believing that it seems more fantastical than reality, initially planning to escape Italy with the remnants of his family. 
Mario convinces Ezio to stay and take the fight to the Templars, in which we see his quest for revenge turn to a quest to uncover how far this Templar plot actually goes and what they want. He learns many strong lessons from many mentor characters along the way, many of whom Ezio did not realise were assassins until just before he himself was formally inducted into the Brotherhood. Ezio discovers the Templar conspiracy goes way beyond his father and brother's death, and his journey goes even further beyond his understanding. We see this story take place over the best part of 23 years from the end of 1476 to the end of 1499. Along the way, Ezio develops from a young man to a mature man and from a mature man to an assassin fighting for something greater than mere revenge. In the end, almost giving back into his urge to kill the mysterious Spaniard Rodrigo Borgia, who is now the Pope, but after a struggle and a further education into Rodrigo's goals, decided to spare his life, believing that killing him would not bring Ezio's family back, and thus ending his life after defeating him and disproving Rodrigo's beliefs and taking his prize, so to speak, would bring nothing. Then Ezio comes face to face, or at least as face to face as possible, with one of the ones who came before an ancient civilization that used to coexist alongside humans many millennia ago, and who have since been misinterpreted by many different cultures as gods. She speaks not to Ezio, but rather through him directly to Desmond, addressing him by name and confusing the absolute hell out of everybody, including Ezio himself. What the fuck? Now Ezio's character development and the overarching sense of mystery are wrapped together, which makes the story even stronger in my opinion. Ezio's character development alone is one aspect of this story that's worthy of note. He goes from a baby as we first see him, to a brash teen, to a young man struggling to understand his purpose beyond his lust for revenge, to an assassin fighting for the greater good as he believes. Not without flaw, but this is only really the first third of Ezio's development. It's great to see Ezio unravel the mystery of the Templar conspiracy and evolve as a character over the course of this game's narrative, because it feels like there's a real emotion in this story, and that is something that's resonated. Assassin's Creed 1 was very simplistic in its approach to character development, Altair was arrogant and his story taught him humility, and that taught him the importance of the creed. But Ezio goes through several phases in just one story, we're not experiencing a short journey with this character, but over two decades of his life. While this could have been clarified in a more distinct fashion in hindsight, it feels like time is passing and that we're experiencing the development over the course of a lifetime. Another really solid part of the story that I wanted to touch down on goes beyond Ezio as a character and onto the overarching sense of mystery that I mentioned before. It's present both in the historical aspects of the game and the modern day. The reason we're visiting Ezio's memories is due to Subject 16's final obsession with Renaissance Italy as the bleeding effect drove him to madness for lack of a better explanation. Desmond and Subject 16's common ancestor in this time period being Ezio. Subject 16 leaves behind many glyphs in the world space for us to find as a piece of side content that somewhat functions as a hint that there's something much more science fantasy going on than just a Templar conspiracy. Obviously this gets confirmed in the story as we approach the end of the game. We see the bleeding effect functioning with Desmond and how prolonged exposure to the Animus can lead to side effects, one of the positives being Desmond picking up Ezio's abilities and the negative side effects are a mystery in which we can only really ascertain through what we learn about Subject 16 as we go, and through the occasional hallucination and dream that Desmond experiences. However, we are led to believe that it is ugly. This mystery goes supernova at the end with only more questions. We meet Minerva who shares information, but it's too early to be understood. And this grander mystery leaves us wanting to know more. It justifies the continuation of Ezio's journey and the first civilization mystery lives on into the next game. Then there's the Templar conspiracy and the mystery behind that. The feeling of uncovering a conspiracy in this game provides a great immersive experience. We feel involved in discovering the answers. We want to know what the hell is going on just as much as Ezio does. We learn the Templar's interpretations of what they're on the verge of uncovering, even if it's not strictly true. We see both sides, if you will, trying to comprehend the same perplexing puzzle that we cannot hope to complete because we don't have all the pieces yet. This isn't done to confuse because the characters are as confused or as wrong as we are. This is an intentional approach to an overarching mystery that began in the first Assassin's Creed game and would carry throughout this entire trilogy and beyond, though it wasn't necessarily done justice after the fact. Assassin's Creed 2 also introduces us to many memorable characters, but the most memorable for me are perhaps those we meet in the modern day. Sean and Rebecca are an interesting pair. 
Sean, like I said, is a brilliant historian, however, he doesn't think much of Desmond. He's frustrated often with Desmond, believing him to just not be invested, and struggles to entertain Desmond's curiosity for what his role is. Sean has an entertaining sense of humour that falls back on his historical knowledge, but at this point, he's quite aloof with us. Rebecca, on the other hand, is pleasant enough, and she's a technician for the Animus. With limited resources compared to Abstergo, this shows her brilliance in this field. Both of these characters are entertaining to interact with and listen to bicker, and hearing them communicate with Desmond whilst in the Animus adds immersion to the context of what we're doing, if not the whole thing. Then there's Lucy, a character we managed to interact with to a limited degree in the first Assassin's Creed, but now we get to learn more and communicate more with Lucy as a human being rather than just an extension to Abstergo. There are plenty of characters that we meet as Ezio that are worth remembering as well. Leonardo da Vinci functions as Ezio's best friend. Mario as something of a mentor figure, though his role fizzes out as it becomes less needed. La Volpe is a mysterious fellow. Bartolomeo's battle-ready attitude as a mercenary makes him particularly likeable, and so many others. Many of these characters can be quite touch and go with their presence, however each leave their own unique mark on the narrative. And the impact that they have on Ezio, sometimes it's implied, other times it's shown, is quite profound. And after all, aren't great characters a key aspect for any formula for storytelling? And I think it's fair to say that Assassin's Creed 2 is full of great storytelling. Away from the storytelling aspect, Assassin's Creed 2 also offers some pretty fun gameplay. Parkour and climbing is a game of efficiency. It may seem clunky at first, and at times it outright just is, but once you've got used to it, you become better at spotting pathways that can speed up the process and begin executing more complex movements that the game allows you to perform through cancelling actions at the correct time or overriding them with another input, such as the backer jet. This allows you to cut seconds off of scaling buildings and traversal overall. Climbing requires you to look for things you can jump up to, you can't simply climb any surface and it can be a bit of a puzzle at times, but that only adds to the system rather than take away from it. It may be a little time consuming and sluggish at times, but if you case your environments you can typically find means to speed up the process as you become more and more skilled at playing the game. If you cock up doing something, it's because you didn't time correctly or you were trying to do things too quickly. Sometimes the game can get confused and randomly throw you off a tall tower to your death, but for the most part, it's a solid system, though it may seem a touch eyesore to begin with. There's definitely a learning curve to it, however, the freedom to do what you will is yours. You're not locked into anything until an animation is complete, and so within reason, how you go about scaling a building is completely up to you. It's not necessarily the most aesthetic of the parkour systems that Assassin's Creed has used, but it's definitely got the superior base concept of allowing the player as much agency as possible, with the limitations that make you think and keep it from becoming mind-numbing, which I feel is important, especially considering how much time you spend climbing or using parkour. The parkour finds itself being a key part of mission design in Assassin's Creed as it should be, being used for navigational puzzles and races. Simply put, it's an essential core element of the gameplay and so it's very important that it works. And it does! Although I will say I'm fully aware that none of my footage is going to show off any gleaming examples of what this gameplay mechanic can actually do, but if I can make it work for me smooth enough, then surely enough anyone else can. And I will say that when you get it working, it is incredibly satisfying, and I remember sinking hours and hours just running around doing parkour with no other purpose. The stealth system had been improved from Assassin's Creed 1, allowing it to function with more dynamics. You can sit on benches, blend with crowds, any crowds this time, which makes less sense than just monks who are dressed similarly to you, but it truly makes you feel like a blade in the crowd at times. Hide in haystacks, wells, underwater, use ledge takedowns, kill from benches or haystacks, pickpocket NPCs to earn florins and throw florins or smoke bombs to the floor to cause visual obstructions or distractions. You can also hire thieves, courtesans and mercenaries to distract guards which further assists you in achieving your objectives. For a game that doesn't allow you to crouch, the stealth systems can be pretty neat when executed properly. Guards don't detect you on sight, there's a time frame between guards suspecting you and detecting you. So if you're doing something illegal or socially unacceptable, a guard may warn you to get off the roof for example, and refusing to do so, or not moving along, may result in detection. This allows leeway for movement between hiding spots when notorious, or in restricted areas, as guards don't instantly just attack for no reason, or because they've simply seen you, and the leeway you get depends on how much you handle the notoriety system. If you do something that attracts a guard's attention, they may only progress to a certain point in the detection system unless you give them cause to go further, or if you do something highly illegal such as kill in front of them, they may detect you instantly regardless of where you are or how notorious you are or aren't. The notoriety system plays a key part in whether or not you're making your life easy for yourself in Assassin's Creed 2. As you get into fights and kill guards or at key points in the
the story, you gain notoriety and if you're not careful, you can become notorious. If this happens when guards see you, the detection process will begin and you'll have to avoid them as they're actively seeking you out. To bring notoriety down, you need to bring yourself all the way back down to incognito by ripping down wanted posters that are ridiculously placed so that nobody will ever see them anyway, killing false witnesses and bribing heralds, which you can steal the money straight back off of them, which only adds a fraction of the notoriety back that you take off by doing this and it's pretty funny. If you keep on top of notoriety, you can for the most part avoid becoming notorious, which means paying attention to your actions and and your notoriety adds an extra layer of thought that makes this game more dynamic. The combat system, though pretty simple, is great fun in Assassin's Creed 2. It's arguably slower than once due to the presence of more stubborn guard archetypes that become more and more prominent as you progress through the game, and you can no longer chain kill like in one way killing one guard through straight attacks has the chance to instant kill the next and so on. You can slash away if you want, but it's not always the most efficient approach. Counter kills are pretty useful, though sometimes this only does a bit of damage depending on the enemy in front of you. These counters can be aesthetically pleasant, and different types of weapon can have different perks and drawbacks. Hidden blade counter kills are an instant kill regardless of enemy type, though the window for activating this is small and can be trickier depending on the type of attack being used against you and the enemy archetypes fighting style. The hidden blade can also counter the widest variety of attacks, whereas swords have a larger counter window but only really function against other swords and daggers. Daggers do the same but with the animations being a little bit different, though it can still be fun. Countering whilst unarmed can disarm some opponents, though not all, including the trickier enemies such as Brutes and Seekers. Though they're not hard once you've figured them out, the only big difference beyond this for them is sometimes you have to dodge their attacks and that's the only way to avoid taking damage. You can use medicine to replenish your health and buy armour that allows you to take more damage which plays into the in-game economy, which we'll talk about shortly. The combat does speed up and become much more fluid and flashy in Brotherhood, but I think the slower, less fluid combat in 2 as a result feels like a representation of Ezio ability at this point in his life. Dangerous, but not in his prime. In fact, I think Ezio's fighting style in all three games accurately represents where he is at in either skill or development at those points, which I'll explain as I go through the other two in more detail. I don't know if it's intentional, but it's a pretty cool detail if it is. For now, it's safe to say that AC2's combat is pretty fun, it can be a bit sluggish at times, but whether by intention or not, it fits the scope of the broader trilogy. Assassin's Creed 2 also introduces an economic system. You can earn money in this game, unlike in Assassin's Creed 1. Ezio can earn florins through finding them in chests or via pickpocketing, as well as at the end of every memory and piece of side content. These florins can also be earned via revenue through renovating Monterigioni. The more you upgrade the town, which requires spending florins in itself, the more you earn every 20 minutes you play the game, not including time spent in the menus or outside of the animus. There's a limit to this system to avoid you farming it for endless florins, and that is that after a while, the chest that you collect the money from will become full, and any excess will be kept by Claudia. So you've got to return to Monteregioni to retrieve the income on a regular basis, or it stops coming in. Florins can be spent at a variety of shops. Transportation will let you fast travel for a fee, basically. At a blacksmith, you can buy better armor and weapons, or repair your already owned armor if it becomes damaged, which happens the more you take damage without repairing it on the go. You can also stock up on throwing knives and bullets for the hidden gun. At a tailor, you can buy pouches to carry more ammunition and medicine. You can also dye your robes to several choices from a small selection that varies depending on which city you find yourself in. At a doctor's, you can purchase medicine and poison as well as heal if that's all you require. And at an art merchant, you can buy paintings to increase the value of Monteregioni and treasure maps to help make your life easier. The more you invest in the in-game economy, the better the gear is the essential endgame. But it's not done to the ridiculous excess that an RPG might go, but rather only enough that there is a positive effect for investing time into upgrading your pouches, armour and weapons. I'll be honest, upgrading weapons is pretty useless and only really provides small differences that you may not even notice, just buy the weapon that looks coolest. Doing this makes the game easy for you later on, giving more leeway in combat for taking damage and more leniency on fall damage by increasing health. Upgraded pouches means you're not spending as much time in shops or scouring for medicine or ammunition, and can go longer in the later game without doing so. This system isn't designed to waste your time, but is there to provide progression to complement the story's development of character, if that makes sense. As Ezio gets more skilled, purely implied, the gameplay stays pretty much the same throughout, he's naturally going to be more capable 
and would as a result likely be better at choosing the gear he utilises. This is a simple way the game allows you to make the game easier for yourself, just as being an assassin might get easier to Ezio over time. Regardless, it's a simple system you can choose to faff with if you want, or you can for the most part ignore it, and either way it doesn't eat too much into your time, which for a story focused open world game is exactly what's needed. The economy gets a tad more depth and scope going into Brotherhood and Revelations, but it's pretty consistent and uninvasive nonetheless. Side content wise, Assassin's Creed 2's open world has some nice side bits you can do in it. Races, beat up events, flying over Forley in a flying machine because fuck it, collecting codex pages though they become mandatory later in the story, doing assassin tombs to get the armour of Altair. Some of the side content in this game fails to aid the story and only really feels like something worth doing once you finish the game and are just dossing about, because the open world of Assassin's Creed 2 Brotherhood and Revelations are better looked at as an elaborate backdrop and so the side content's value tends to come from when it aids the story. However, the pieces of side content that do aid the story are pretty compelling. In order to achieve full synchronisation with Ezio, as Rebecca puts it, you must get all six seals found in the assassin tombs you can come across. This allows you to acquire the armour of Altair, which has the beneficial perk of never breaking, cutting out one of the more annoying early game mechanics. This is a reward for doing the side content that aids the main story because Ezio canonically got that armour and wears it at the beginning of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood regardless of whether or not you get it in two. And getting the armour allows you to take tons of damage and never breaks which means that you no longer have to worry about your armour being broken, which is a positive benefit, and it's not some ridiculous piece of Eden that doesn't get addressed, it feels like there's a story purpose to having it, and it's just cool, not over the top, standard armour. Doing the truth is worthwhile too. Doing that adds an extra layer to the overarching mystery of the game, and the puzzles you do along the way can be a nice, satisfying change of pace from parkour and stabby stab stealth. You also get to see the Assassin's Creed take on a lot of history outside of the Italian Renaissance period, which is typically delivered as it happened, but with subtle hints of Templar or Assassin influence and the involvement of various pieces of Eden, many of which later got used as major plot devices in future installments. I won't lie, a lot of the other side content doesn't really grab in the same way it might were it in any other game. I won't pretend these games are perfect, of course they're not, they're Ubisoft games. It's not because they're not fun, if you do them they are, it's because more often than not they don't necessarily aid the story, and in my opinion the best side content in Assassin's Creed is the stuff that does aid the story, and that's where the best side content in 2 comes from. The modern day has some more meat to it as well. We see the bleeding effect in action on Desmond using his skills to climb and fight at the very end as the credits roll. We get even more of a hindsight take on the events of the game, and the environment the modern day takes place in is much more friendly if not a little initially standoffish. The wall between the modern day and the historical parts of this game is nowhere near as thick as it was in one either, getting more input from modern day characters as we're in the animus, including the glyphs and one of my favourite features in the game, the database. With this database we can learn about historical landmarks, events and figures of note, including some whom we kill and others we might ally with, some are mentioned more so in passing, and the landmarks may have no bearing on the narrative, but they'll have a database entry compiled by our modern day companions just the same. So coming across a cool building that in context is just that, is memorable nonetheless. So while we're exploring these world spaces as Ezio, we can also become immersed in the history to a degree. Now, I love history, and a lot of my love for history can be credited to how Assassin's Creed 2 specifically delivers that history to the player. In fact, the older Assassin's Creed games helped me discover my love for history to the extent that it's the only A-level I ever actually bothered to get. It would also be remiss to not mention this game's extraordinary soundtrack. It sets tone brilliantly. You can identify the region you're in based on the atmosphere provided by Jesper Kidd's score. You can tell what mood a moment or mission has. If you're notorious, the music is more tense than if you're incognito. If you're in combat, the music is heavy and intense, and the same can be said for chases. The music conveys every emotion the game wants you to feel, whether it wants you to be intrigued by the mystery or immersed in a poignant or even upbeat scene. There's a track that fits everything this game has to offer. All in all, Assassin's Creed 2 is a game rich with fun gameplay. It may be dated, but it functions. The storytelling is packed with intriguing mystery and excellent character development, memorable side characters, and a beautiful score to top it off. Visually, the game is aged, but for a 12-year-old game with a 5-year-old remaster, I think that can be forgiven on the basis that it didn't matter anyway. I love Assassin's Creed 2. It lived up to younger me's expectations off the back of the first game, and I have adored it ever since. And honestly, what I wouldn't give to wipe my memory and re-experience this beauty of a game for the first time. I feel like the experience I had playing this game for this video is the closest I'll ever come to being able to actually do that. Unless I develop severe amnesia later in life, if that's happened and you're watching this video, all I can say is enjoy the irony.
Assassin's Creed Brotherhood picks up more or less exactly where Assassin's Creed 2 leaves off in both the historical and modern day storylines. We start off with Ezio, after a brief flash forward to a few years later, back beneath the Vatican after his mind-fucking conversation with Minerva. He's confused, but he has to keep moving. Ezio regroups with his uncle Mario and we run through the now built streets of Rome. In Assassin's Creed 2, Rome was just a background and a really shoddy one at that. It looked dreadful. However, being in Rome properly in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood is an entirely different experience. We get to experience the vibrance of this new city in the space of the opening few minutes before we return to Montericcioni. Ezio is torn over what to do with the apple, intending to throw it into the river to allow it to wash out to sea. However, he's conflicted so Mario takes the apple and tells Ezio he can decide what to do with it later. Once back at Monteregioni, we get a similar opening to Assassin's Creed 2, but with Ezio already an assassin. Monteregioni is peaceful, prospering clearly benefiting from Ezio's renovations over the course of Assassin's Creed 2. As we ride our horse through the streets, which we could never do in 2, you can hear NPCs amazed that Ezio is back, almost like he's famous to these people, and why wouldn't he be, when he lives in the big fuck-off mansion on top of the hill, overlooking the entire town, and is responsible for it no longer being in disrepair and having moss so advanced, it had probably discovered Bitcoin. Ezio believes his fight is over, and that he's got all the time in the world now. He helps a random lady carry a box of flowers to the villa for Cloudy his birthday party. He assists the stable master retrieve Mario's favourite horse after it had run off, and helps the mercenaries repair the cannons on the battlements, in return being allowed to test them out for himself, which is definitely not foreshadowing. He returns to the villa where the assassins are gathered to hear of what he witnessed in Rome. Ezio tells them about Minerva and the things she showed Desmond through him, and they struggle to understand. Upon asking how Rodrigo died, Ezio tells Machiavelli that the Spaniard lives, to which Machiavelli instantly goes from 0 to 100. The Spaniard lives? He sets out for Rome instantly, intent on rectifying this blunder he perceives as being caused by Ezio's arrogance. Brotherhood expands on this, assassins don't kill for themselves. Ezio didn't need to kill Rodrigo for revenge, but he failed to realise that as an influential Templar, he had to die anyway, lest he risk calamity. Lo and behold, we're at the beginning of the second game in a trilogy, so you can probably imagine how his judgement worked out. Ezio returns to his room to have a bath where he's joined by Katarina Sforza, and some hot, stinky, unsanitised, not safe for work content ensues. The following morning, Ezio is slapped with the biggest cock block of all time, a cannonball flying straight through his window. With his armour destroyed, Ezio gathers the gear that isn't damaged and jumps out the window because that's the only way an assassin knows how to exit a building. The Borgia are attacking Monteregioni, led by Cesare Borgia, the ambitious warrior son of the Pope Rodrigo, or as he's now known, Alexander VI. Ezio rides through the streets, we see the destruction of the city we helped build all around us until finally we arrive at the battlements where we help defend the city using the cannons that we'd practiced with only a day prior. The battle is already lost at this point and the only objective is to buy time so the villagers can flee. Why are they referred to as villagers when Monteregioni gets referred to as a city? This is really confusing. <laughs> Unfortunately, eventually the enemy does get into the city, and after a short fight on the walls, they breach the city gate. With Mario defeated at his feet, Cesare Borgia shows his face. Now in possession of the apple, Cesare challenges Ezio, causing Ezio to come running towards him, shooting Mario in the head, killing him instantly, and drawing Ezio out to get shot as well, wounding him and sending him falling off of a rooftop which I can't imagine being particularly helpful. Now we need to retreat. Ah! Fighting through Borgia soldiers at the villa itself to get to the sanctuary beneath, to a secret passage behind the statue of Altair. Finally escaping the city, Ezio tells his family that Mario is dead and states that he intends to arrive for Rome, because Cesare Borgia is now in possession of the apple, and that's not good news. What's most important here is that Ezio's work is not done, and Monteregioni is no longer a safe house for the Assassin Brotherhood. However, due to his wound, Ezio passes out on the road. This brings us to the modern day, with Desmond in the van with Sean, Rebecca and Lucy. They find themselves at the last Assassin safe house in all of Italy, the now fallen into complete disrepair Auditore Villa. We can see Monteregioni in the modern day here, there's life present, but this city never found itself thriving again. This helps hit home the impact of the opening. We get to witness Desmond perform a leap of faith for the first time, plunge into the sewage system with Lucy in order to open the sanctuary beneath the villa from the inside and set up the new hideout within. We get to see the bond 
between these characters that are strengthened. Sean is no longer taking pot shots at Desmond at every given opportunity, just as an example. More on this later. Upon re-entering the Animus, we rejoin Ezio in Rome, where he's being nursed back to health by some random woman who never becomes relevant again. She gives Ezio his gear, including new robes, watches him test the hidden blade and thinks, yep, that's perfectly normal, and then Ezio leaves to find a doctor for his arm. After doing that, we're unleashed on Rome, where the main bulk of this story takes place. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood's main story can be considered quite short, especially considering that a lot of the main content is merely introducing the side content. However, a lot, if not most, of the side content aids the story, and so this game may have a shorter story than two, but it also has a longer one if you see fit to do it. The story makes sense either way, but Brotherhood introduces a lot of optional flesh which makes its open world fit well for what this game needs it to be. And so in a way, instead of having a linear narrative of just mission to mission mindless slogging, the game makes an active effort to include the entire open world space as a part of the story, and as a result, the entire open world space helps tell the narrative. The story sees Ezio take the fight to the Borgia in an attempt to liberate Rome from Templar control, specifically from the ambition of Ezio's dangerous new adversary, Cesare Borgia. Assassin's Creed 2's story showed Ezio develop from a young man to an assassin, and Brotherhood shows Ezio develop from an assassin to the mentor of the Italian Brotherhood. Ezio comes to understand the importance of the Brotherhood's work and its importance in empowering society against oppression. Not because he didn't already believe it, but rather because this game allows him to put it into practice, and the effectiveness of these strategies in the fight against the Borgia is what earns him his mentor's status. A good chunk of the narrative is dedicated to Ezio strengthening the Brotherhood's ties to the mercenaries, courtesans and thieves, as well as recruiting assassins to join the cause, though this is to a point mostly side content outside of certain parameters, as well as taking away the Borgia's power through liberating areas from Borgia influence, destroying war machines that Leonardo da Vinci was coerced to design, killing Cesare's allies, for example the Baron and his French pals, and plenty of other main and side content. Many characters carry over from Assassin's Creed 2 as well. La Volpe, Machiavelli, Bartolomeo, Claudia, Maria, Leonardo da Vinci, and we get to see these characters do more and have a bit more presence than they perhaps had in 2. Claudia, for example, we only really saw as a bookkeeper in 2. However, she runs the courtesans and proves herself to Ezio that she is capable of more than just balancing the books, becoming a fully fledged assassin. Maria actually speaks in this story, often fight- Oh, that's actually- that, 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 that's actually a really bad description. Often fighting Claudia's side against Ezio's overprotective attitude of disapproval for Claudia involving herself, which is one avenue through which we see Ezio overcome some level of arrogance that he'd accumulated functioning often as a lone assassin in two. We even see La Volpe and Machiavelli at odds, with La Volpe believing Machiavelli to be a traitor due to too many coincidences, and Ezio believing otherwise despite his own differences with the man. Ezio being proven right after discovering who the real traitor was leads to repairing this relationship and shows these two characters strengthen as allies, and furthermore strengthening the allegiance between Ezio and Machiavelli despite their disagreements, leading Machiavelli to promote Ezio to the mentor of the Italian Brotherhood. You've got La Volpe and Machiavelli at odds, Ezio and Claudia at odds, Ezio and Machiavelli at odds, and so you've got more character-driven stories, you've got more relationship-based stories in there, and so you aid these characters, the character aids the narrative, and the narrative in turn aids the characters. Brotherhood understands that the main concept of Ezio building up this Brotherhood would require some bridges to be built or mended at the very least. Because in the end of the day, who wants to see everybody on the same side getting along all the time? That's just poor storytelling. If you want to tell a character-based story, not that I'd argue that Brotherhood is especially that way all the time, you need to have some form of disagreement. Brotherhood does this quite well. Seeing the resolution of disagreements build a bond stronger than the one that existed before is a strong way to consolidate that feeling of unity amongst the Brotherhood that this game needed. Furthermore, the return of characters in more recurring positions in this story helps consolidate them as fixtures rather than allies for certain sequences, whereas many would only show up for brief periods in Assassin's Creed 2, it's good to see them back and be more consistently present. Recognisable faces in the Brotherhood make it feel more personal to Ezio, and therefore more personal to the player. And the expansion of these characters that we met over the storyline of the last game helps with the world building. Away from other characters, as I mentioned, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood puts a lot of stock in its side content. 
I've already said something along these lines, but the best Assassin's Creed open worlds typically lend themselves more to functioning as elaborate backdrops for the content within to aid the storytelling, and Brotherhood masters this with, in my opinion, the franchise's best example. You have the Borgia Towers, which you can liberate as you find them by killing the Templar Captain within and then lighting the signal fire. Once you've done this, you can renovate buildings and shops in the area in question, as well as recruit more assassins to your cause. This is strengthening your Brotherhood with recruits and income, and reducing the Borgia's influence. Shown as part of the side content that you can also elect for the most part to not do if you don't enjoy it, but the effects of doing it are a great representation of what the story is trying to tell. Then you have the Romulus layers in which you take on an underground cult being manipulated by the Borgia, again reducing the Borgia's influence. Through doing the layers and acquiring the keys in the end you get some armour that looks like total shit but basically functions in the same fashion to the armour of Altair from the last game. Furthermore, these set pieces take you out of the open world into little linear segments, and I love when open world action adventure games do this because those missions feel like the most detailed. A mission that takes place in an open world space isn't going to necessarily change anything around you, the environment is kind of stuck, and it doesn't feel as personally made, however in a set piece you're not going to visit this space again anything could happen, and the Ezio trilogy overall has some absolutely brilliant set pieces. Speaking of, the best in this game have to be Leonardo's War Machines. They don't always function brilliantly and sometimes they have absurd full synchronization objectives, such as not taking damage when in the tank. How do you expect me to not take damage in this thing? But what sets these missions apart is they all have unique gameplay mechanics. When it comes to gameplay, if a mission has you doing something unique that no other mission is going to have you do, such as drive a tank, then it's going to be more memorable than your standard run-of-the-mill tailing mission. Not that there's anything wrong with a run-of-the-mill mission, however, it makes these missions quite special because they're fun, they're new, they're interesting, they're intriguing. Leonardo's War Machines all have a feeling of this, and you get to liberate dangerous weapons from Borgia control and while you're at it, existence along the way therefore it feeds into aiding the main story. And of course these bits are the most enjoyable bits of side content because they're the highest quality. They have entire world spaces built and dedicated entirely to one side mission. Most missions don't need to be this high quality, however the fact that they're in the game makes you think where's the next one coming from. Speaking of missions that take you out of the world space, we've got Ezio's repressed Christina memories. These are very personal to Ezio. After the opening of 2, we don't really get to see Christina again. These missions show memories from between key events in Assassin's Creed 2, inside which we find out what happened to her, and how she died and the impact that had on Ezio. I believe these were initially intended to be a part of 2, however they didn't make the cut and are therefore reworked to be in Brotherhood as repressed memories of Ezio's. This adds some emotional impact either way, and it's just really quite moving. They become available at certain thresholds as you increase your percentage of overall completion, which functions as an incentive to do other content. In these spaces, we get to see snippets of world spaces from Assassin's Creed 2, and while I wouldn't argue that they're set pieces, the fact that the missions take you out of the immediate open world space help highlight them as memorable. I don't understand why Ubisoft has developed an aversion to these types of missions in their latest games, but these were always my favourites of Assassin's Creed games of Days Gone. They just feel more personally crafted and there's more soul behind them. I'm not saying that other missions don't have that feeling too, but it's nowhere near as strong as it is in these sorts of set pieces or in missions that simply take you out of the world space into unique areas built specifically for that mission. But yes, I agree it's also important to balance that with open world stuff. And there's plenty of that too. In assisting the Thieves Guild, Ezio encounters the Sento Ochi gang, which as you can imagine has ties to the Borgia, so doing the Thieves missions fits the theme of taking the fight to the Borgia. The Courtesan missions serve a similar function in helping you take the fight to the Borgia in small ways, which still aids the story. And assassination contracts can be taken up at Pigeon Coops, but you initially pick them up in waves from the mercenaries. You find yourself sent to kill many Borgia related targets. Then you've got Templar Agents missions that has you kill specialist agents of the Templars and by extension the Borgia. Kind of self-explanatory, these tend to be unique missions though they're pretty short, but help add to the feeling that doing it is actually having an impact and therefore the world building, which can be said for all of these mission types. The game has some collectibles too, such as feathers which is a little reference to Petruccio's love for them, but it's nowhere near in as much abundance as it was in 2 as there are only 10 to 2 rather than 100, which was a bit mental. Then there are the Borgia flags which you remove. I guess this represents reducing Borgia influence on the people, but it's just still a collectible with no other real function. 
You can send your assassin recruits out on missions too via the pigeon coops, and doing so can level up said recruits provided they survive the mission. As they level up and get upgrades, they become better and therefore can take on more dangerous missions. They get more health and better equipment for calling into fights in game too. This shows the building of the Brotherhood, the end result being these recruits can become full assassins. Renovating Rome, as mentioned before, increases the Brotherhood's strength due to income from that, and that income isn't going to the Borgia due to that lost influence on renovated districts. And one of my favourite pieces of side content in this game has to be the glyphs. Subject 16 has yet another truth to share with Desmond. This time we have 10 puzzles to solve. They can be a bit more complex than twos, but once you figure them out, you fly through them and feel like quite the code breaker in the process. However, I hope you know chess, otherwise you're fucked. But Google is your friend if you get a bit stumped. The truth in Brotherhood goes a step further with a proper gameplay puzzle at the end of it, with some mind-boggling revelations, though it would take some time to actually figure out what's meant by it, though we later learn it's the first hint that Desmond Miles has a literal son. This also functions as extra meat for the overarching sense of mystery I mentioned a lot when talking about Assassin's Creed 2, and aids the story in that way, not just as part of Desmond's modern day story, but as part of the overall story of Assassin's Creed, regardless of whether or not that was actually done justice later on down the line. Away from the side content, the modern day has more to it now too. Brotherhood allows you to exit the Animus whenever you want. Unfortunately, there are no key points in the story besides the very start and very end where leaving the Animus is necessary, and thus many players might miss out on a lot of what makes Brotherhood's present day so enjoyable. As Desmond, you can interact once more with your companion and get extra context for historical events and key moments. You can do more than just that, however, as you can also now access emails that you can read. Later in the story, you gain access to Sean, Rebecca and Lucy's emails and read theirs too. It shows some cool world building, and that's what makes it so fun and immersive to look at. Beyond this, you can actually exit the sanctuary and explore Monteregioni as Desmond at night. You can use this small space as a place to do parkour as Desmond, which can feel pretty fun as it immerses you in the concept of the bleeding effect a bit. Collect some artifacts dotted around the town, you're on a timer for it however, and you can only do this in short 10 minute bursts. So you're not exactly free to explore forever, and it's only really a small area, but you can see how Monteregioni looks for the modern day characters, and its emptiness really consolidates that feeling that the assassins are gone from here, furthering the impact of the opening of the game, which is pretty cool. If you don't choose to revisit the modern day after key points, you're going to miss out on a lot of excellent character moments. However, for Assassin's Creed players who believe the modern day to be nothing more than obstructive, Brotherhood provides the best compromise possible, as the only mandatory bits are at the beginning and the end. I feel like Assassin's Creed Brotherhood has the best modern day of any Assassin's Creed game, and even then it could have stood to improve on a few areas. For example, I feel like there should have been more story-wrapped modern day moments. Back to talking story, the plot is so intertwined with all the side content it's hard to distinguish where to segment what with this game. So let's get back onto the point. Save us from a bore lake later on. Obviously, Ezio's approach to destabilizing Borgia control in Rome works, and he manages to take the apple back from the Borgia and later kill Cesare. This leads to the modern day characters discovering where Ezio put the piece of Eden at the end of said story. The mindfuck from the last game doesn't end just yet with the modern day taking yet another confusing but intriguing route. The modern day assassins head to the Colosseum where they find the Peace of Eden. We get some more first civilization mumbo jumbo being spewed at us in which we learn some of the differences between the Isu and humanity. This is also the first time that we see Juno, who later takes on the role of a nuanced antagonist of sorts. Upon reaching the apple, Desmond interacts with it. The apple seemingly controls him and makes him kill Lucy, which just adds to the entire mystery. Where is it going from here? The game throws down so much intrigue in its ending that it's exciting to think about the possibilities of where it goes from there. All we know is this interaction with the apple and killing Lucy causes Desmond to fall into a comatose-like state and the credits roll instantly, leaving us confused as to what in the holy hell just happened, but excited to continue this story in Assassin's Creed Revelations. But before we can shift on to talking about that game, there are some odds and ends that I'd like to tie up with regards to Brotherhood as far as the gameplay is concerned. For the most part, Brotherhood's gameplay is pretty much identical to 2's. However, there are certain areas that have seen massive improvements, one such example being the combat. Some might argue that Brotherhood's combat is too easy, and on some level I do agree, but I've always seen it more as a challenge of efficiency. The combat shows Ezio in his prime, slashing through enemies like they're nothing, one after another, really quickly. Even the tougher enemy archetypes introduced in Assassin's Creed 2 are really easy to take down now. This combat system isn't so much about surviving, that's not the difficult part. The challenge comes from keeping the chain going 
keeping it as smooth as possible, trying to make it look cool, trying to feel satisfied with the animations. Now you have chain kills and double kills. Chain kills allow you to instantly enter a kill animation after killing another enemy. And double kills allow you to do that, however if you hold the attack button, you will kill two enemies at once using a projectile. The combat is flashy, there's visual diversity, and the flow isn't interrupted. And if you find yourself overwhelmed or the situation is a bit tricky for classic combat intervention, you can call in your assassin recruits to handle the situation for you in a couple of different ways, either by sending them into the fight or calling an arrow storm, killing all enemies in the vicinity provided there aren't simply tons of them. Even then, it's still good for thinning your enemies' ranks, which makes it quite useful if you find yourself overwhelmed, though that scenario is pretty unlikely, considering Ezio can cut through his foes now like butter, because like I said, he's in his prime, and in a way, the combat represents this. However, it's still for the most part Assassin's Creed 2 gameplay, therefore it can sometimes be a bit of a clusterfuck. The Assassin recruits also have benefits in stealth scenarios, especially during tailing missions, in which they can be used to take out tricky guards that are causing you issues. Though you've got to be careful, because they may kill the subject of your tail and fail the mission. Renovation has also seen a bit of an upgrade considering in Assassin's Creed 2 you could only renovate Monteregioni to get income every 20 minutes. Now you can renovate the entirety of Rome. That includes renovating all the same shops that you'd be renovating in Assassin's Creed 2, but also purchasing landmarks and skyrocketing your income exponentially. If you invest in this open world, you reap the rewards. This adds up over time and eventually you'll look in your pocket and go, holy fuck, I'm Jeff Bezos. And you can invest that money in more or less the same things that you can invest it in in Assassin's Creed 2. Gear, more renovations, health, projectiles, paintings, etc. Another improvement is now you can ride horses in the city considering the city is the only environment and you can implement that in your parkour routines. So if you add that on top of your pre-existing knowledge of Assassin's Creed 2's parkour system, you can make for some pretty smooth movements. It would also be remiss of me to not mention the DLC, the Da Vinci Disappearance, which is one of my favourite DLCs in Assassin's Creed to date. I mean it's not saying very much as there are a lot of DLCs in this franchise that I believe they simply don't make enough napalm for, and the Da Vinci disappearance is far from perfect, however it's good to see Leonardo Da Vinci become central to a plot. Considering in my opinion he's one of the best side characters in the Ezio trilogy, a story that revolves around him rather than one that just includes him where it suits the story otherwise, was well earned. Overall Assassin's Creed Brotherhood functions as an excellent middle part to the Ezio trilogy and is probably in my opinion my favourite Assassin's Creed game of all time. My personal like for it is more or less on the level with Assassin's Creed 2, However, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood sports many improvements, the most notable of which being an open world filled with content that suits the narrative. That way, an 8-hour story could also be a 20-hour story, and there's not much difference in how much sense it makes. If you do the content that aids the story, it still makes sense, it still feels important. But if you don't, you aren't missing out on key information. There's fun gameplay, interesting set pieces, and fun storytelling, and that integral overarching sense of mystery is maintained improved and expanded on. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood is a prime example of a game that makes you want to sink more hours into it than you have to, and it doesn't waste your time through forcing you to do it by putting in ridiculously long arcs full of filler or leveling curves, and I feel like any open world game can learn from this sort of example. We also see the development of Ezio Auditore from an assassin to the mentor of the Brotherhood. It builds off the back of Assassin's Creed 2's coming of age story and tells the story of Ezio becoming a leader. It may be reusing a lot of assets from from Assassin's Creed 2, but Brotherhood makes sure that that doesn't matter by being unique enough to the point where that would only be recognised if you are looking to point that out specifically. And in my opinion, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood is arguably the strongest act of the Ezio trilogy. And with all that said, it's a strong springboard for what comes next in Assassin's Creed Revelations. That leaves us with Assassin's Creed Revelations, the final chapter, if you will, of the Ezio trilogy, and boy, what an excellent send-off for a beloved character this game is. Revelations ties up every plot point in Assassin's Creed so far up to this point in a concise narrative designed to push onward to the next phase of the overall Assassin's Creed plot. It may not have been utilised properly after the fact, but when you isolate this culmination game, it's hard to describe this beauty as anything short of brilliant. I won't lie, as far as open world structuring goes, I found Constantinople to actually be a bit dry. 
It didn't feel as engaged as Brotherhood's, but the narrative of this game, written by the wizard Darby McDevitt himself, makes up for it a thousandfold. Revelations begins with Desmond still in the coma from the end of Brotherhood. He's in the Animus to stabilise him. We appear to be in a basic Animus simulation. Here, Desmond meets Subject 16, Claycast Merrick, who seems to be much less scrambled than how we knew him to be throughout his encrypted messages found over the course of the past couple of games. He explains to Desmond that in order to wake up, he needs to find a sync nexus, separate his memories from those of Ezio and Altair. This takes us back to Ezio, a few years after the events of Brotherhood, now in his 50s. Ezio has ventured to Masiaf in order to seek the wisdom of Altair's library in a quest to better understand his purpose. This plan goes awry when Ezio arrives at Masiaf to discover that it's infested with Templars. Ezio didn't set out on this journey with violence on his mind, however here he finds himself using it once again. The opening cinematic shows Ezio taking on an entire army of Templars, just cutting them down one after the other. The cinematic is basically one of the trailers that was shown, but it works every single time. It gets you pumped for the story to come. Unfortunately, Ezio is inevitably captured, considering the sheer amount of Templars surrounding him, that was no shocker. He's still a human being. The cinematic then shows Ezio about to be hanged, but before he can be, he escapes. It's almost like upon seeing the amount of Templars here, he chose to get captured as part of his plan to get close to Altair's library. The opening stages of this game use atmosphere and music to make us feel like this is our last journey with Ezio. The soundtrack is dramatic and desperate, it captures the emotion of seeing this character's development lead him to this final journey and it really hits home. Before Ezio can gain access to the library he needs to acquire a book, the book is in the possession of the Templar Captain Leandros, and so only moments prior Leandros was trying to catch Ezio, Ezio's now trying to catch him. It's a really dramatic set piece, I'm not entirely sure what else there is to say. This opening takes care to highlight Ezio's age, with him saying this used to be so easy, which goes to show that the game doesn't forget that Ezio's an old man now. Ezio eventually kills the Templar Captain Leandros and discovers the keys to gain entry to Altair's library have been spread across Constantinople. This means that Ezio's adventure must now take him to the city, where he must seek out the Masiaf keys in order to open Altair's library and gain the knowledge he believes he seeks. However, unbeknownst to Ezio, the keys in themselves teach Ezio the lessons he needs to learn. The story of Revelations is Ezio learning that it's time to put the life of an assassin behind him, and that he must have the humility to say that he's seen enough for one life, in contrast to Altair who, due to spending decades in possession of an Apple of Eden, couldn't bring himself to do this. Ezio uses the Masiaf keys to witness key memories in Altair's life that lead to this conclusion, bringing a sense of closure to both Ezio and Altair's stories. The story also shows Ezio finding something to live for outside of the Creed, meeting a woman named Sophia Sartor. Sophia as a character fascinates Ezio from the very beginning. After Christina's death, Ezio himself states something withered inside him, but Sophia brings those feelings back. Unfortunately, this leads to Sophia getting caught up in Ezio's assassin business, but this functions as almost a final incentive to live for himself, rather than live for the Brotherhood until his death. Revelation shows Ezio as an old man, now fully understanding of the creed that he's lived by, which is beautiful to see when this is a character we've seen develop from a young man with limited to no understanding regarding his assassin heritage, to the mentor of the Italian Brotherhood, and now to a master assassin with enough understanding of his purpose to know that it's not his place to understand it, believing in and being able to explain the confusing maxim of the Creed brilliantly. You mentioned the Creed before. What is it? Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. That is rather cynical. It would be if it were doctrine, but it is merely an observation of the nature of reality. To say that nothing is true is to realize that the foundations of society are fragile and that we must be the shepherds of our own civilization. To say that everything is permitted is to understand that we are the architects of our actions and that we must live with our consequences, whether glorious or tragic. Unlike in Brotherhood, characters don't really carry over in Revelations. Ezio is alone in a new place. However, we do get to meet some new characters who instantly throw down their own charms. Yusuf Tazim is the leader of the Ottoman Assassin Brotherhood and he's full of charisma. Hoş geldin kardeşim. Unless the legend is a lie, you are the man I long to meet. Renowned master and mentor. It's your auditory, the la la la. Prego. Uh, forgive me, I have a hard time remembering that Italian gibberish. Da Firenze, the city where I was born. 
Ah, yes. Uh, so, by your custom, I would be Yusuf Tazim da Istanbul. I like that. Istanbul. Yet another name for this city. Evet. It's a local favorite. Uh, come, mentor da Firenze. I will show you around. This instantly welcoming attitude is exactly what Ezio as a character needs at this moment considering the journey he's undertaken to get here. But he's not the only new character of note. Prince Solomon is intelligent and wise beyond his years, and seeing that in a young character definitely keeps Ezio on his toes, and Sophia is passionate and curious. These characters may be new, but they gel with a more advanced Ezio in a way that feels authentic. Of course, the game wouldn't feel the same without having some form of Templar plot, and thus Ezio finds himself involved in keeping the Templars at bay in Constantinople. Unlike Brotherhood, the Templars are already on the back foot here, which means there's no real sense of urgency. The Byzantine Templars are mostly found in areas not dissimilar to those found in Brotherhood. You kill then captains, though simply too many of them are cowards, and light signal fires. These towers become assassin hideouts inside which you can appoint recruits as den leaders if they're leveled up enough, which protects them from being reoccupied by the Byzantines later on. This introduces an extra layer to the liberation and notoriety systems shown in Brotherhood. If you become notorious, the Templars can attack your dens. If you ignore it, the Templars reoccupy them and you have to retake them. If you defend your dens, you get a tower defense mechanic which isn't terrible, but it's awfully boring. Liberating areas allows you to recruit assassins to the Brotherhood here in Constantinople, and you can do similar things with them that you could do in Brotherhood. However, sometimes the recruitment missions are more unique and memorable, though they aren't exactly stellar pieces of storytelling they do quite a lot as far as world building is concerned. Once leveled up enough to be a bureau leader, an assassin may have missions for you. And just like Brotherhood, a lot of the story aiding side content is introduced as a part of the story initially, and then it's up to you as to whether or not you actually do the rest of it. This doesn't happen as often with Revelations as it did with Brotherhood, however, as there isn't actually that much content that aids the story. There are some bits of side content that are worth doing, but there isn't very much there that's a part of the overall narrative rather than just something that branches off. For example, collecting memoir pages in order to acquire the Ishak Pasha armor was fun, especially with the set piece at the end, but it didn't really add very much. And besides, for my playthrough, the game actually glitched, so I couldn't collect all the pages. And as a result of that, I couldn't get the armor, which really miffed me. But like I said, anything that could have gone wrong in these recordings did, so what did I expect? Make no mistake, there is side content that does aid the story, however, the world doesn't really make it clear that it's there all the time, nor does the story go out of its way very much to tell you all about it. And those things you can do are, of course, the Master Assassin missions, which are introduced in the main story, however, the thought of them carrying over doesn't really apply. You may think it's just a bit of plot for installing a bureau leader in the main story, however, this can happen several times with several different stories. It's just whether or not you find yourself leveling up assassins to the point where they can take on those roles. And then you've got faction missions, but again they don't necessarily feel like they're filling in as many blanks as they would have been doing with Brotherhood. They're easier distinguished as side content, which for Assassin's Creed you could either take as a positive or a negative, depending on which way you look at it. For me, it just made it feel like one more thing that really wasn't worth taking the time to do. Then you have the book quests, in which you collect books hidden throughout the city for a secret cutscene with Sophia at the Galata hideout. And then you have the Piri race missions, which basically expand on the bombs mechanic, which is introduced to the game, but we'll talk about that later. Not the missions, they're just kind of about the bombs, but the bombs themselves. Overall, the range of side content found in Assassin's Creed Revelations is much smaller than that of Brotherhood, and it also doesn't feel as relevant to the main narrative and what you're doing there. It doesn't feel as important. The side content is not in the way, which I respect, but sometimes it feels like it's maybe a tad too far out of the way. Revelations does, however, make up for it. Before we get onto that, gameplay-wise, Revelations is pretty similar to the other games, but it adds a couple of features that really changes it, despite only being tweaked marginally. The hook blade is useful in parkour and combat, with new takedowns allowing for counter steals which allows you to steal money from your enemy in open combat without killing them, and counter throws which allows you to non-lethally slam your enemy into the ground, which sometimes knocks them out. You can also now use zip lines in traversal, and the hook blade also helps with speeding up the parkour process, which helps considering Ezio is an older man now, therefore some assistance in doing the parkour makes more sense than Ezio just being able to keep up with the speed of his younger self, though he does to a point. And then you've got the bombs. There's a wider variety of bombs than just smoke bombs. You throw them and they explode and they do all sorts. They can cause distractions or damage, depending on what you want them to do or how you make them, which is pretty cool, but it's a system I consistently forget 
forget about five minutes after it's introduced to me. As far as combat's concerned, Ezio's fighting style is still fast, however it's not as elegant and finishes are far more brutal. There are still some Brotherhood finishes in there, but I feel like this represents Ezio's frustrations with the Creed in the sense that it's standing between him and actually living and his desire to leave all the fighting behind. Brotherhood's finisher moves are very fast paced and stylish, and a lot of them are present in this game too. However, there are plenty of new animations that are slightly slower, but they give you the impression that they'd hurt like hell. Make no mistake, I don't think there's a nice way to get stabbed, but Revelation's new animations look like the least nice way to get stabbed possible. Some of the animations are really overkill too, which really adds to that feeling of brutality. Brutal violence in old Ezio's fighting style really suits this character at this point in his story. I don't know if this was intentional, however if it was, it's really clever. The set pieces in Revelations are hands down the best in the franchise, if you ask me, without exaggeration. These are usually found as you search for the Masiaf keys, and these set pieces take you to underground areas with fast paced parkour courses or chases, complemented by great visuals and brilliant music. On the modern day front, just because Desmond can't leave the Animus doesn't mean there isn't a modern day storyline. Desmond is removed from Ezio's memories quite regularly to entertain Subject 16's existential questions, and we can also hear Sean and Rebecca speaking whilst in the Animus loading screens, including a new voice, that of William Miles, Desmond's father. Furthermore, on Animus Island there are other gates that we can access which shows us Desmond's journey, telling the story of Desmond's upbringing and how he left the assassin life behind, up until the point where he was captured by Abstergo at the beginning of Assassin's Creed 1. From the main menu we can also access the DLC, The Lost Archive, this expansion is complete shit, but basically, it's Desmond's journey with some more irritating puzzles, however, it focuses on the journey of Subject 16. The most memorable bit of this is that we learn why Lucy was killed. All this time we thought she was a secret assassin amongst the Templars, when in reality she'd secretly been converted to the Templars, and was going to betray the assassins after Desmond found the apple. And therefore everything up until the ending of Brotherhood was going exactly how Abstergo planned it. Outside of the stories of Ezio and Desmond, Assassin's Creed Revelations gives us Altair memories to experience as well as I've mentioned before, in which we get to see key moments in Altair's life, and in these memories we get to see what happened to him after the events of Assassin's Creed 1 tying up loose ends with regards to his story, and applying those lessons to conclude Ezio's. With a beautiful ending that leads Ezio to come face to face with Altair in the library, discovering that Altair's library contains no books, only Altair's body, and another disc with another memory on it. No books. No wisdom. Just you, fratello mio. When Ezio comes face to face with another apple, he acknowledges that he's seen enough for one life, and in this moment acknowledges Desmond directly, and it's honestly one of the most beautiful bits of storytelling I've ever seen and no amount of words would ever do it justice, so I'm just going to have to show you, though I imagine you already know about it. Desmond? He's talking to me? I heard your name once before, Desmond. A long time ago. And now it lingers in my mind, like an image from an old dream. I do not know where you are. Or by what means you can hear me. But I know you are listening. I have lived my life as best I could. Not knowing its purpose. But drawn forward like a moth to a distant moon. And here at last, I discover a strange truth. That I am only a conduit for a message that eludes my understanding. Who are we, who have been so blessed to share our stories like this? To speak across centuries? Maybe you will answer all the questions I have asked. Maybe you will be the one to make all this suffering worth something in the end. Now, listen. 
There aren't many moments in games that can reduce me to tears, but that was certainly one of them. This is the sync nexus Clay was on about, and this triggers a message from the ones who came before. We see the destruction of their civilization, and it reveals the location of the Grand Temple, spurring Desmond to wake up from his coma, stating that he knows what to do next. And that ties up everything so far excellently, leading the story onwards to the next segment, which begins with Assassin's Creed 3. And that leaves us at the credits of Assassin's Creed Revelations, ending the Ezio trilogy. This isn't the end of Ezio's story, however. That's concluded in Assassin's Creed Embers, where we see the final days of Ezio's life. Above all else, the Embers short story sets up Shao Yun as a character for that to go absolutely nowhere worthwhile. But Embers also shows Ezio's death, meaning that the Ezio trilogy isn't about stories that occur over a character's lifetime. They are about a character's lifetime. We saw Ezio born, we saw him as a young character trying to understand his place in the world, we saw him as a master assassin become a mentor, a leader, we saw him come to understand that it wasn't his place to understand, and finally, we saw his death. So I always find Embers to be an essential watch after finishing Revelations. Assassin's Creed Revelations is simply put full of brilliant storytelling. There's so much to love in this game. We see the final chapter in Ezio's life as an assassin, with in my opinion the best writing this franchise has ever seen. We get some fun gameplay set pieces, brilliant action, an amazing soundtrack that conveys the emotion of this game perfectly. It ties up all the loose ends so far to spur the franchise onwards to the next chapter, and it's brimming with emotions. And it filled me with so much joy to be able to replay this game again. As we've gone over, I don't believe the game is perfect, however it suits what it's intended for as a story concept perfectly. This is an excellent last hurrah of Ezio's journey, the completion of his character development, and I don't think the Ezio trilogy would have had anywhere near as much of an impact if Revelations was not a part of it. I was going to do an entire segment for this video on the disaster that came after, but to be honest, I just don't care about Assassin's Creed like that anymore, and it'd defeat the point of this appreciation video for what used to be. The Ezio trilogy is, in my opinion, the glory days of this franchise. Fantastic, high-quality, story-driven content with world spaces that serve to aid that story, rather than just big spaces for the sake of it, and there's not a microtransaction in sight either. I love what Assassin's Creed used to be, and that's enough for me. And that's where the joy of replaying these games this time came from. I was no longer bogged down by the frustrations of the franchise's loss of identity in recent times, because I just don't care about that. There's enough Assassin's Creed for me in the games that were. Am I going to continue to bother with future installments going forward? I don't know, probably not. Those games just aren't for me. But I couldn't let the 10 year anniversary of Revelations go unacknowledged considering the history of my channel and the love I have for the Ezio trilogy on the whole. I will always love the Ezio trilogy and will in future have no problem revisiting Assassin's Creed titles of old. But with everything that's gone on with Ubisoft, this video did take some mental gymnastics to justify it first. Hopefully though, all that aside, this has been an enjoyable bit of content. Which brings us to the end of this absolute monstrosity of a video. Jesus, it took a while to make, but I'm glad that we're finally here at the end, because now you guys actually get to see it, and if you're watching this, it means it actually got completed. <laughs> Which is nice considering a year ago I had a Brotherhood video planned that I wound up scrapping because I just didn't like how it was turning out. This time around, I committed myself to this project and I think it's paid off. So, thank you all for watching this video, I really hope that you've enjoyed. Be sure to go ahead, leave a like, subscribe, share the channel with your friends and all that wonderful stuff. That would be super fantastic. And with any luck, I will be seeing you all very soon with another video at some point. But until next time, take care and goodbye.